May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It occurred to me earlier this morning when I preached at the 8 o'clock service that we're still holding the season of Easter here, and what a great thing that is. But it hit me that all the stores across our great land have moved their Easter chocolate out and have probably already placed their order for Halloween candy. <laughs> but in the wisdom of the church, we know that this Easter gift is too much to take in in just one day. So we stretch it across a 50-day season of Easter, seven whole weeks the second one of which is this morning. And today's gospel picks up where last week's gospel left off. As Mary Magdalene returns to the disciples to let them know that she has seen the Lord. But in fear and uncertainty, they remain hunkered down with doors locked, lest the authorities who executed Jesus might come a-calling for them as well. And we're told, quite remarkably, that Jesus came and stood among them. No keys, no door to open, just appeared. And says, in his first breath with them, peace be with you. And then promptly shows them his hands and his side, that is, his mortal wounds, transfixed now to an immortal body. And perhaps that gesture was to certify his identity, but, but what if showing his wounds was actually the means whereby the peace of Christ is offered? That is, to share the moment with the disciples, with us, as a bridge between the uncertain fears of this life and the sublime peace of resurrected life. In the church where I was raised back in Arkansas, behind the high altar was this beautiful wood reredos hand-carved by Bavarian artisans in the early 20th century. Statues and crosses and ornamental wood, and the centerpiece was a life-size statue of Jesus with his hands out like this. I think I've shared here before that as children, we called him Stop Sign Jesus <laughs> because this stance seemed like he was saying to us, halt and of course we were not allowed up around that area around the high altar anyway so halt stop sign jesus only later did i learn that this is an ancient stance for blessing sometimes known as joshua blessing but it is the ancient stance in which jesus comes and says peace be with you our Western tradition of shaking hands when we greet one another is actually a variation of this open palm to the other. Because you see, open palm intends no malice. Open palm bears no weapon, no threat. It's why the universal sign of surrender is hands up. But Jesus' gesture is even more remarkable than all of that because he's showing not just open palms, but he is revealing his wounds, his wounded nature, openly. And in that same breath, he offers them and us peace. You know, our liturgical practice of exchanging the peace before we turn to the table to share a meal it's an ancient practice from the earliest days of our Christian tradition. We've regained it, reclaimed it in the last generation or so. But it is an open offering of open palms and of peace in Christ's name. 
to one another. It's not a time to chat with your friend or your spouse. It's not a time to say, wow, the weather is really cold today, or what a nice dress that is. It's not a time to connect only with those with whom you're most familiar right around you. I remember visiting a church one Sunday. I was going to be serving as a priest there, and I wore my civilian clothes instead of this clergy collar that first day my family went with me. We sat unannounced to anyone. We sat in the back of the church. So we were clearly just visitors, just a young family. At the peace, the family right in front of us greeted those next to them and those in front of them and those beside us and were very clear in their intention to not make eye contact with us and there would be no exchange of the peace with us. It was very, it was very telling. It was hurtful, to be honest. Especially since the next time we were there, I was introduced as the priest and I had my collar on and or we were in like Flynn there and everyone greeted us warmly. But you see, exchanging the peace is about presenting ourselves to others around us in the name of Christ and bidding them peace by offering them not just a passing glance, but full presence of mind and body and spirit in that moment. What would it look like if we were all to do that? It's a very vulnerable and authentic thing to do. Very few situations in our society allow for such authenticity, full-on presence anymore. But the exchange of the peace is one such place. And if we really stop and think about it, we're asked to not only open our palms, but we're asked to reveal our woundedness to one another to reveal our imperfections, our brokenness. Can you offer yourself to someone whom you may not know well, but whom you trust all that they have to offer you in return is peace? And can you, when someone offers their authentic, truest selves, can you return that peace with no air of judgment or snarky humor or anxious release of a crack of a joke or anything. The beauty of Easter, my friends, is that resurrected life does not abandon or deny the cruciform wounds of our lives, but rather gathers all of our brokenness up and redeems it as part of the whole to which this risen Christ comes and says, peace be with you. There's the gift. For my part, I think it was right fortuitous for us that Thomas wasn't there that first evening. His doubts surely can serve as a proxy for our doubts, right? And who cannot empathize with Thomas? being left out. It's interesting that Thomas is called the twin in John's Gospel, but nowhere is his sibling ever mentioned otherwise or or identified, which has led some scholars to suggest that there's an invitation for us to consider ourselves as Thomas's twin, fellow doubters on the way. Thomas is left to his own thoughts in what must have been a very lonely week, nursing an uncertain faith and a very obscure future. I think it took the full week for Thomas. That is, it took the fullness of time for Thomas to prepare, to give ample space to receive the Easter gifts in his own life. Well, yeah, the church has made Thomas something of a foible for his lack of faith, 
his perpetual epithet is Doubting Thomas. But notice that Jesus does not scoff at Thomas on first sight. The pattern is exactly the same as the week before. Jesus appears in the locked room of fear. He greets Thomas personally with peace, shows him his wounds, invites inspection. And Thomas res responds with a full-throated and fully present con uh, confession of the risen Christ standing right before him. I don't think there's a more beautiful confession of Christ in all the scriptures. The exchange that evening would transform Thomas' life forever as he leaned into that vulnerable, authentic way of following Christ, of, of offering peace in Christ's name. He did so all the way to present-day India, where the church still holds him in high esteem for his faithful life and witness. And the pattern is there for all of us, Easter people in our own right. In the fullness of time, that is precisely at the moment when we are each prepared. The resurrected Christ bearing hope in you, in me, enters the dim rooms of our stultified fears in which we lock ourselves. He enters and with an easy breath of full presence bids us peace and in showing us his wounds, takes our wounded souls into his, redeems us in divine love, and thereby creates the space for us to receive the Easter gifts in our own lives so that we might be transformed in a way that as we go out again, we might share that peace with others. It is this peace that is the nexus into God's will for us. It is that nexus into God's will where vitriol and vapid fear evaporate on the broken brow. And there is space provided for the serene exhale and no that this is life as it is should be. Broken, yes, but wholly redeemed and wholly for a purpose. And for that, my friends, may God's holy name be praised. Amen.